So I'm going to talk to you um, today about some learning problems in uh, brain-computer interfaces. Um, so my talk will be in three parts. Um, first, I'll introduce brain-computer interfaces. Then I will talk to you about what are features. Um, and then we will talk about how, how we can learn about the user, the user who's going to use these uh, interfaces. So uh, the principle behind a brain-computer interface, it's a loop uh, in which the user, which you see here, is part of this loop. That's, that's pretty important. Um, this user has brain activity that we're measuring through a device, which can be invasive or non-invasive. In this talk, it will be mostly non-invasive devices like electroencephalography. Um, this data that we acquire through a device is then um, processed. We have signal processing to extract features. Features are um, parts of the brain activity uh, that can be linked to a mental state that we are interested in. Uh, which the user is, uh, is uh, into. And uh, we're going to be able to classify between different types of mental states in a way that I will show you um, afterwards. Uh, the difficulty is that there is a lot of noise in the data and it's hard to extract uh, features uh, properly um, uh, within all this uh, noise, which is due to all the ongoing brain activity that is not necessarily only due to the mental tests that we're trying to, uh, to detect. So um, another part of the brain-computer interface loop is once you have extracted and classified features, is to translate them into something uh, useful for the user. So these can be commands or some type of communication that the user might be able to do thanks to their brain activity. Uh, but we can also think of uh, more passive brain-computer inter interfaces in which the, user, uh, the user's interaction with a system will be modulated thanks to the information that we get about their brain. This we will see towards the end of the talk in an application on visuospatial attention. So the, one of the challenges is to do all this in real time, which means we have to be fast and efficient. Um, so uh, just to give you some notations, uh, we're going to call M the measurements coming from the device. Uh, X is the single processing result, so uh, some features. Um, y, the labels that we attach to the features, thanks to some smart uh, machine learning, and uh, we can model the output of the classification as a prediction function f. And uh, the purpose of all this is to, to get commands, to have some uh, interface that the user can use. And this can um, come after a series of labels has, have been issued. Actually, I mean that we're going to look at windows of data, and commands don't necessarily come at each at each individual window, but sometimes we need to aggregate information across time before we can issue some commands for the user. So let's give some examples here. Um, so M, as I said, was a measurement. So here they're windowed in time. So I attach T as a, an index to, to say that we're in time. And um, this example <coughs> is um, going to be two classes. We're going to try to classify brain activity according to whether a person is um, imagining moving their feet or imagining moving their hands. Um, Percheller showed in the 1990s that uh, when people were actually making such movements, hand movements or, or feet movements, uh, there were patterns on, uh, on the scalp, when you look at scalp electrodes, that showed a decrease of oscillations at the region responsible for the movement. So uh, you see, for example, uh, the decrease is shown in red here, um, but uh, hands 
are situated uh, on uh, both uh, hemisphere, if, you look, if, you, if you're moving both hands, whereas the feet, the, the foot motor region is more central. And when people are imagining moving their hands or doing the actual movement, it's almost the same patterns you see on their uh, brain activity. It's a reduction of oscillations in the, let's say, about 10 hertz uh, range. So um, when, once you know that, you can filter the data in the, in the frequency range where you expect to find such, uh, such information, and then try to find some spatial filters, uh, as if you were focusing on certain electrodes instead of others, certain spatial filters that will, that will uh, increase the contrast between the two, uh, the two situations, imagining moving hands or imagining moving the feet. And so um, uh, it's not that hard. Uh, it's a very uh, now uh, well-established uh, protocol that can allow people, for example, to move a cursor on the screen. I'll show you just a little example. Here you have two players playing a, a Pong game in Rome at Fondazione Santa Lucia. And so uh, the player on the left, for example, um, imagines moving his feet to bring the, the paddle down or moving his hands to bring the paddle up. Okay. So this is uh, the, actual, the actual speed at which the system is, uh, is occurring. So you see that's not very fast, but uh, people have to you know, um, actually get into the, uh, into the motion of imagining moving their hands and feet. And it's not something that you do uh, at a very fast pace. And the system is looking at time windows of the brain activity and trying to uh, infer uh, which is uh, which is the motion that the people are, uh, are imagining. Um, I can show you some other type of uh, features. So th these features were based on spatial filtering plus the variance of, uh, of, the, of um, frequency filtered uh, data. Another type of features is perhaps even more simple. Uh, it's to look at uh, the signal at a given electrode, for example. Then, uh, sorry, it's a bit invisible, but here you can see a, um, a low-pass filter uh, version of this uh, signal. And then from this um, low-pass filtered signal, we could extract some data points. And that this can be done for windows, sliding windows also. And um, this type of uh, temporal features is, a lot, is used a lot in uh, evoked response uh, detection. And uh, one of the evoked response we're going to speak a lot about in this talk is P300, uh, which occurs 300 milliseconds after somebody uh, has uh, perceived uh, a stimulus that they have an interest in. Uh, so the stimulus that they're interested in are called target, and stimuli, stimuli that they're not interested in are called non-target. And the BCI is able to classify between target, non-target, and thus we can get um, this device that, we, that was made by our group and uh, tested here at, a, at Nice Hospital, allowing a person to, to type using their brain activity. Uh, I will go into the details of how this works a little bit uh, later, but it's based on evoked responses and the analysis of sliding windows of just temporal, uh, temporal data. So the person is trying to type one letter at a time. She's watching stimuli that flash, and each time that the group of letters contains the letter she wants to type, this letter, after a few repetitions, uh, gets uh, shown to her. So the command is typing a, a letter. <clears throat> Another example of features are uh, covariance matrices, which look at <coughs> the um, well, correlation here more between uh, chunks of data across uh, sensors and, uh, and time. Uh, these can be, um, can be also quite interesting, these covariance matrices, because they have some invariance properties that, uh, that uh, we'll go into a little bit later. 
So then, once, once you got all these features, what you want to do is get labels uh, attached to them. So uh, the way to get this prediction function to be able to classify between several classes. I showed you an example with two classes, but it could be more. Well, the way to get it is to use a training data set in which we already have labels. That's an uh, important uh, point. Uh, generally, in brain-computer interface, we do supervised le learning. Supervised means that we have already knowledge of some data set in which there are labels. And then, from this, uh, these pairs of data plus labels, we try to find a prediction function that would well predict these exi existing samples, but especially would well predict future uh, samples. This is called uh, generalization. And um, OK, a, a very simple example. For example, if you have x, uh, your features, we could look for just a, a linear uh, pro projection of the data. Uh, who's, who can, which can then be cut in two halves, and then we get um, one class would be the, the, the data points on the left, for example, and the other class, the data points on the right. This seems uh, like a very crude way of you know, uh, explaining the data. But first, you have to find this A and this B. It's not so obvious. Uh, and then, um, actually, it works. So that's what uh, brain-computer interfaces use all the time. It's linear discriminant analysis. Um, so some observations for those of you who are really like data crunchers and who want to go back and try things out by yourself. Uh, well, you can access some open data sets. Uh, there are some data sets out there that you can uh, download uh, where there are um, data and labels. And you could try um, methods, your favorite methods on them. Um, and in this talk, actually, I will not go so much into all the details of the classification methods. I prefer to give you some overview of the fields and the problems that there really are in the field other than just the classification, OK? But it's still, there are some classification uh, issues that can be improved. So if any of you are willing to talk about that later, I'll be happy to. Um, we, an observation is that the classifier itself is not that crucial. That, for example, uh, support vector machines are not that much better than this linear discriminant analysis that I showed you. But we do have a curse of dimensionality, which is that we don't have that much data. And why don't we don't have much, that much data? Because it takes time and money to get people under these equipment and, and sit with them and explain to them the, the tasks they have to do and acquire the data. And, and uh, as I'll show after, there's so much the variability in the data that it's also a big, big problem. Um, because of, so the curse of dimensionality is a problem means that we have small uh, data sets compared to the dimensionality of the features that we're looking at. Dimensionality of the features is in the size of the vector x that we're looking at. So in order to reduce a little bit this vector x, to have a smaller space in which we're trying to do the classification, uh, we have to find feature elimination strategies to, to get rid of all the dimensions in x that are not really telling us anything about anything useful about the data. For this, there are many, many uh, uh, methods. And it's an, it's an important um, uh, field to do the, all the pre-processing and the pre-classification, uh, pre let's say. Now I want to talk to you about some uh, of the crucial problems that we have in this field, which are the feature variability. So this example, using still the x as a features, uh, give you an example of, of uh, just a drawing. But let's imagine that we have features that are well uh, separated into two classes that we had before. And I call them E for existing. And we have a new data set, xn. And when you superimpose the two data sets, they don't even match. I mean. So uh, it would be hard to use the classifier that had been optimized for xe on xn if they're not in the same, uh, in the same realm. Um, so where does this variability come from? 
Well, it can be due to taking different people. Different people have, uh, as, as uh, I will uh, explain also, quite different uh, brain activity for different regions. Uh, it can be due to the same subject coming back on a different day uh, after having eaten, after taking coffee, after being tired, after whatever, and the, their signals are totally different. It can be even within the same session, somebody between the beginning and the end, uh, a few hours later, their brain activity can have, uh, let's say that the baseline or the background brain activity can have drifted a lot and even the actual features can also uh, ob observe some drifts. So this uh, certainly is a, a great problem. So one of the ways to uh, overcome these problems are to well, start a session already by calibrating. Okay, I have a different subject or the same subject in a new session, I will calibrate. Uh, what does it mean to calibrate? It means to tell the person what to do at, at such and such a time. And like that, we get labels. We get the labels for this particular person at this particular time. We get a, a, a little data set with labels from which we can learn a, a new classifier. But this lengthens the process. People get discouraged. They, they have to start by spending maybe 10 or 15 minutes by just doing something useless for them, and they don't want to use such a system. Uh, moreover, they don't get the feedback because this, uh, the system is not trained yet, so it can't provide any feedback, it can't provide any commands, so they're just doing something out of the blue. They might be mind-wandering and not doing the task that we're asking. Uh, and their brain activity might be totally different from what it would be if they were actually doing the real uh, brain-computer interface. So uh, that's uh, an issue. So the solution is just to eliminate this initial calibration, get rid of it. For this, use existing data sets. And too bad if they're not, they don't correspond to the subject. We'll find maybe ways to, to get around that. And begin the BCI with feedback, even if it's not too good, maybe can cheat and give them a good feedback if you know what they're trying to do, but begin with, uh, with feedback. Why is there a variability from one user to the other? Well, many things are, are user-specific or person-specific uh, in our uh, body, and the brain is part of it. Um, you have uh, brain sources. I mean, what I call sources are the time courses of the different regions, uh, I don't want to go into details, but there's a postsynaptic activity um, that you measure in EEG. And this, this is a, a little bit peculiar to each subject, even though there are generalities. Uh, the cortical foldings are different, apart from the, the, like the major uh, uh, folds. The details of the folds are different. So that means that the orientations of the currents are different. And this means that the relation they have to the electrodes are different. So when you put a, an electro uh, cap on different people's head, you're not just measuring, even if the activity in the brain was similar, maybe the activity on the electrodes is not similar because things are not uh, propagating exactly the same way because of cortical foldings different, tissue conductivities are different, tissue shapes are different. So, so ideally, we should look at brain-computer interfaces features that are specific, um, what I mean, that are matched to the specifics of the people, so uh, in source space. Instead of looking at sensor space, we should project the activity that we measure on the device back to the brain, and then we can compare easier uh, and get things that are more comparable across subjects. Or else, use features that are kind of tailored to be a bit more invariant. For example, this, these covariance matrices I showed you before, they're quite, the distance between the features in, that, uh, in these covariance matrices, if you take uh, the Riemannian geometry, uh, is invariant to linear transformations. So it makes them a bit more invariant to different forward problems of the, of the measurements. So, Okay, I advocate source space rather than sensor space because I believe it reduces this, the variability uh, due to different uh, electrode placements, different, uh, uh, different shapes of the brain, etc. And it makes things closer to the neurophysiological reality that's in there and more interpretable uh, scientifically as well. 
as, as was shown um, during an INR pro project called CoAdapt, in which um, and we tried to do a, a brain computer interface in which we used the error measure. Um, we tried to infer from the EEG electroencephalographic measurements themselves whether uh, somebody was aware that there was an error, like that the, that the BCI wasn't working, for example. So uh, what uh, we showed, well, it was uh, Matthew Dyson and Boris Burel's group in Marseille, was that by going into source space, and, and focusing on the region inside the brain where the feedback-related negativity was expected to occur, and knowing the orientation of this source uh, within the brain, well, it was much easier to be able to detect this, uh, this source than if you were trying just on the, on the electrodes. Um, especially in, in the context in which there's little ground truth data or little labeled data like um, error potentials. <clears throat> but uh, apart from the spatial configuration, it's certain that there's differences between uh, people's brain activity also um, within the brain themselves itself. For example, if you look at here, for different subjects, um, time frequency representations. So time is uh, horizontal, frequency is vertical. It's a short time Fourier transform. And um, the people are imagining moving their right hand between seconds zero and two, okay? During this time, there's a desynchronization, which you see by the blue appearance of a blue uh, a blue segment within some oscillations that are more sustained in the, in the before and after the movement. Okay? You can see that th these colors indicate that there, there's oscillations in the signal. And when you look at the details of all these frequency, time frequency maps that were averaged over many repetitions on a single trial, it wouldn't be so clear. But, well, um, it gives the impression that you can almost recognize a subject or classify subjects well, given their time frequency maps. I mean, um, they all have very uh, different, actually, frequencies at which their, uh, their uh, brain is oscillating in the motor region. Um, the, the way after the, after the end of the movement, there's a, a rebound. Uh, the oscillations reappear uh, even higher than the, at the baseline, and the way that this rebound uh, occurs is different across subjects. So some, some um, subjects only have the mu and not a beta uh, oscillation. Uh, so actually, uh, using the same classifier for all, uh, all these uh, different subjects would not uh, work well. You can see that they're, the features are just too different. So, how can we go about then uh, classifying new subjects from existing ones? Well, an idea that is uh, uh, appearing in the in the data science community is um, is to do some domain adaptation to transform uh, the space in which the features live into the the, in the original space to be able to to use existing classifier. So here I, I'll, go, I'll show you an example where, where we take each data point of the new data set and we put it back into something that should be close to the existing data set uh, via optimal transport, in which Gabriel is a specialist here. Um, and then it uh, would allow to use this, the, the, the classifier that we had already trained even for the new data. It works if the new data is transported in green, but it wouldn't work if the new data was stayed where it was in, in gray, right? Because, well, you don't know, but <laughs> let's imagine that the classes are like here and here. Um, oops, sorry, I, ju I just went to, to the end. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so the idea, there's just one slide of math here uh, saying that uh, trans uh, optimal transport is uh, to find a link between the existing and the new space uh, linkage, uh, which is going to minimize the cost it takes to transport data from uh, one uh, space to the other. And this cost is, um, is uh, summarized here by just a, a distance, actually the sum of the 
of the distance between pairs of uh, all the, the points to be transported. And uh, we try to find a plan that will minimize the, the cost of transportation while um, moving the mass, the globally, the mass of the samples from one space to the other. And there's very nice uh, theory that, uh, that shows the, uh, you know, very fast algorithms to solve this and uh, the well posedness of the problems, etc. We can add some regularization, uh, which can uh, even separate classes if we already have some uh, knowledge of classes in the existing data set. Uh, this term here to accelerate uh, algorithms, uh, the solutions using a synchron algorithm. So there's a lot of very nice. Uh, literature on the subject and we're just trying in our team to apply it to uh, brain computer interfaces and here uh, I showed an example in which the p300 wave for two different subjects uh, doesn't look at all uh, similar from one subject to the other and by applying this transportation uh, uh, principle uh, you see the blue and the red are the target and non-target for one subject, and the green and orange target, non-target flashes for another subject, projected in two dimensions, just to make it simpler. After transportation, the two types of, uh, of data have really uh, converged to this very similar uh, regions, and so we can use the same classifier that we had for the initial subject uh, for a new subject. Uh, it's still a bit hard to apply these techniques in real time because uh, when we start off with a new subject, we don't have much data yet. And we need a little bit of data in order to be able to learn the transportation plan. So it's still a bit uh, uh, awkward to, uh, to apply it in real time, but uh, we're working on solutions. So then even if, if we have a solution that, that works okay at the beginning, or even if it doesn't work okay, we need to improve it because uh, during the session, the things might change and, uh, and we can use existing data acquired during the session just to improve uh, the classification. So the idea is to add a, a loop within the loop in which we use the, the labels that we've just predicted to make some training data uh, that we use in the background to update a classifier. It's getting a bit technical maybe, so I don't want to, uh, to bore you with too much of this. But uh, to do this, we need to have good metrics to assess performance and know if the classifier is getting better or worse, etc. So this is important, and especially in the adaptive and co-adaptive even settings where uh, the brain is changing and the classifier is changing. It's, uh, it's a little bit uh, difficult to find proper matrix. We can also use meta information, extra information like the error potential to get some other source of information of, as to whether the, the system is working or not working. <clears throat> so a strategy is to start off with some generic uh, uh, classifiers classifiers that already exist, uh, to use transfer learning, to use invariant features, but then once, once the system is starting to, to work, to uh, use the data that has been acquired to train a specific classifier and then we can get better, better results. So there are, there is a lot of um, interest at the moment of, uh, of using um, uh, well, machines, uh, you know, external machines to acquire the data and use uh, existing databases that, uh, on which we already have lots of, uh, of training that has been done to do uh, ensemble learning, to do, uh, you know, more sophisticated uh, machine learning than if we were just using one uh, computer with a single uh, data set. So this is quite uh, important work at the moment. Now I would like to um, talk a little bit more about the user uh, and give three uh, examples of um, applications. The first one is still a bit mathematical and then the two other ones are more uh, uh, translational and even medical. So uh, to learn about the user, um, let's say 
we want to probe the user to know, for example, uh, what are the tasks, the mental tasks, that they would be able to do that we can best use for a brain-computer interface. Would you be uh, more able able, I don't know, but uh, let's say, uh, would it be easier for you to be imagining moving your tongue or your feet or your right hand so that we can get a good uh, uh, knowledge from the brain activity of the moments at, wh at which you're using this and this and this uh, mental imagery. So this is a question that we, that we asked. And um, the idea is to to uh, have an exploration ex exploitation strategy where we we're going to probe ask questions to the user in order to know about their um, uh, their mental uh, states but in an automatic way so we use a reinforcement learning uh, approach for, um, which is um, which is called the stochastic multi-armed bandit in uh, machine learning but basically it's as if you had you were in a casino with many slot machines in front of you and these different slot machines are going to represent the different tasks that you could ask a user to perform and uh, if you're playing in a casino you want to get the best reward so you want to to test the different machines test the different tasks and to find out which one is, is giving the best, uh, the best chance of winning. So for a brain-computer interface experimenter, the best reward is to have a good classification rate. Uh, so uh, in our setting, we're going to uh, explore the different tasks uh, in an optimal fashion, um, not in a uniform fashion. Because in general, um, if you want to explore between different tasks, you're going to ask the person to sit in front of a computer and, and at a given prompt, they're going to have to imagine to move their right hand and then there'll be another prompt and it'll be their feet and then their tongue and then their left hand and randomized so that they can't get into a kind of pattern, but it's going to be randomized, but they're going to do a lot of all these movements. And some of these movements may never give any good uh, classification uh, outcome because maybe uh, for this movement you know there's no brain activity that you can measure properly from the outside from eg so they're just doing all this in a purely waste uh, for in pure waste because it will never be used in the end to control anything so our idea was to be a bit smarter and to uh, gain information while we're probing the person in order to concentrate more on the best tasks and a bit less on the worst tasks. It's quite simple, but uh, using this um, bandit approach, we could get a nice framework in which um, we have a, a confidence interval in f uh, which is um, bounding the actual true classification rates that a given task is supposed to give. So the true classification ra rate is the red blob here. We don't know it because we have only a few samples. Since we have only a few samples, we have a confidence interval around this uh, classification rate, which is uh, all the bigger as we have few samples. The more samples, the smaller the confidence interval. So uh, this um, upper confidence bound algorithm by our just gives a very simple principle. Choose the arm, the bandit arm. So for us, it's choose the task to present to the person that maximizes the upper bound on the classification rates. So we look at all the tasks and we, we choose the next as the next task, the one that has the best, the best upper bounds, so it's a kind of optimistic view of the classification rate. And when we do that, and then we get a better estimate of the, of the, of the classification, classification rate for this uh, task. And we can prove that if capital N is the total number of tasks that we're asking the person to do, um, and TK is the number of tasks, a number of times the person is going to do task K, uh, the, we have, we're going to know the classification rates quite well uh, as TK uh, grows 
And for tasks that are not optimal, there's a bound on the number of time we present these tasks. So it's asymptotical, it's like when n gets big, but actually we, d we tested it online for quite small numbers of n, like about 100, like the person had to do 100 times uh, certain tasks. And we showed that uh, using the upper confidence bound algorithm, the people were spending really less time doing tasks that couldn't be well classified. And then the second benefit is that we get better classifiers for the tasks that are good. So I think it's a, it's a cute way to, um, to uh, waste less time because uh, really experimental time is money, uh, uh, not just money, but it's really hard <laughs> to uh, have people sitting in experiments, etc. So we have to, to find ways of making the most of this, uh, of this time. Now I'm going to show you uh, an example of what I called at the beginning a passive uh, brain-computer interface. Uh, it's a problem, uh, well, it's a setting which is about visuospatial attention. I don't know if you're aware of this, uh, this field, but it's studying how people um, uh, project their attention to different parts of the visual field. And you may be surprised, but to, to learn that um, your attention is not only focusing at the, your gaze. Your gaze is, it's easy to see your gaze, it's where your eyes are looking at, generally, um, and, and normal vision people. But uh, in addition to the place where your eyes are focusing, you may have visual attention, uh, which is, uh, uh, going like to the periphery of your uh, visual field. And this is called covert attention. For example, if you're meeting somebody and you're looking at their face, but you want to also look at some other parts, uh, well, you might be yourself deciding to move your attention to another part of the visual field while you're looking straight at their eyes. This is called endogenous because you're deciding to look at another part. And then there could be some exogenous covert attention in which, oh, something has happened and you don't want to pay too much attention. You don't want to show that you're paying attention to this event, but this event has captured your, uh, your attention. It's exogenous uh, covert attention. So in the, we made a brain-computer interface study with Romain Trachel, who was a PhD student, to try to, um, to detect uh, the locus of attention using EEG in real time, and to adapt uh, to adapt visual stimulations to this uh, to this knowledge. So I, I think um, I explained just before uh, the difference between overt and covert. So I hope it's clear. Um, so we decided. Okay, the, the, the difficulty we use the Posner task, which means that um, in a proportion of trials there will be a Q. Um, indicating, okay, there will always be a cue to indicate to the subject where a target is going to appear. The subject has to look at the central fixation cross all the time. They don't move their eyes, but then a cue, which is in the central region, uh, is going to indicate whether they should put their attention to the left or to the right. And if they put their attention correctly uh, to uh, where the cue says, and the target appears there. It's a very faint target, and they have to respond to some very faint thing about the target. Well, their response is going to be more accurate if their attention had been already uh, set to the place where the target uh, appears, and it's going to be faster as well. So there is an effect of visuospatial attention on the reaction time and on the accuracy of the response. And um, what Posner task does is, in 80% of the cases, it gives a cue to the side where the target is appearing, and 20% it gives a cue to the other side. And this way it can show that there's a, an effect of the, of the pre-cueing of the visual spatial attention. Um, what we did is, um, actually we, we modify, well, we, we introduce some ambiguous targets 
uh, uh, sorry, ambiguous cues, cues in which the people couldn't really say whether it was left and right or right, but uh, quite subtly it was cues where they couldn't even know whether they should be able to say whether it was right or left. I think there are a bit too many uh, uh, <laughs> verbs in my... So the idea is it's moving dots, random moving dots. And they're going to, uh, to flash for a brief period of time. And in the ambiguous cues, actually, these random moving dots don't have any preferential direction. But it's hard for the people to, to notice whether there was a preferred direction or not. But we, we asked them to look at those random moving dots and then uh, um, direct their intention right or left according to the, the direction of the random moving dots. And in some cases, it's predictive. So it's a, right, it's a direction that's quite clear that they can extract because there's a real direction. And in some cases, it's not clear. There's not a real uh, global direction, so it's an ambiguous cue. And then the targets appear and on the left of the, uh, or on the right. So what we did is um, we measured reaction time. We measured target error, which was the response to whether the target was oriented in a plus or positive or negative uh, angle. And we measured the what we call spatial error was if they had uh, responded correctly to the random dot uh, uh, direction, even though in the ambiguous case there was no correct uh, direction. So and then we, uh, we designed two brain-computer interfaces from this uh, protocol. One was we called adaptive display. If we detected from the brain-computer interface that the visual spatial attention was on the right hemifield, then we, um, we projected the target on the right. And if we detected that it was on the left, we projected the target on the left. And the way we, that we, uh, could, uh, the way we could classify between left and right was by looking at the um, oscillations in the occipital electrodes which are close to the visual, uh, the visual um, uh, areas of the cortex. Um, so this, um, this we call endogenous because actually the person is looking at the random dots very briefly, then they decide themselves to put their attention on the right or the left. And the idea was that as the experiment went on, we put more and more and more amb ambiguous cues for some subjects, at the end, there were only ambiguous cues. And so, in a way, they were deciding themselves whether to put the attention on the left or the right. There wasn't any, any information. And we were able to detect, in quite a good proportion of cases, I must admit, it's self-reported. We asked the persons to say afterwards whether it had appeared at the right place. Uh, so it's self-report. Um, and then we had another uh, protocol in which we had decided in advance where the target would be. But if the attention that we decoded was not at the right place, then we put a warning. So we called it more exogenous because there's a warning, which is a little um, red square that appeared around the place where the target would appear just to recapture the attention to the right place. So. Um, well, the spatial error rate is the, the capacity of extracting the, the, orient um, the direction of movement of the random dots. This spatial error rate um, was f about 50, but less than 50 uh, for the ambiguous cues. Less than 50 maybe because the self-report was a bit optimistic. And it was, uh, we had done some uh, uh, contrast adaptation and uh, in order for it to be 10% uh, in the predictive cues. And uh, with adaptation, um, um, sorry, I won't comment on that right now. Then the target reaction time, we, we were able to show that it decreased in both, the, um, so in green, sorry, in green is the adaptation protocol and in red is the warning protocol. So the reaction time is enhanced especially in the warning protocol. Uh, but the error, uh, the, the accuracy at which the person is responding to the cue uh, is more enhanced for the adaptive protocol than for the warning protocol. So we, um, 
And we're still working on a paper uh, about this, but um, there's quite a lot of potentiality of this type of uh, research for enhancing human machine interfaces uh, in situations where uh, people are, um, you know, in a bit stressful environments or, or boring environments, but where they have to respond fast to certain, uh, certain um, um, indices in there uh, visually. So um, it can be interesting for pilots, it can be interested, interesting for different people who have to monitor things to uh, be able to present to them information that they need to process in the right uh, place of their, uh, where they have attention. To finish, I would like to mention some other, uh, more, uh, some other application of brain computer interfaces which uh, may here help people who are unable to, um, to communicate. Uh, it's work that we did uh, with Nice University Hospital in which they work with people, well, they have patients who uh, have a neurodegenerative disease of a motor neuron called amyotrophic, amyotrophic uh, lateral syndrome, uh, SLA, maladie de Charcot in French. And um, they, called on, they called us because uh, for some patients, uh, they tried to find ways to uh, provide them with alternative uh, communication devices, even though uh, you know, their body um, is unable to move. And sometimes they, they really have trouble finding residual motor function to put some, uh, some actioner uh, um, in front of a muscle. So uh, we decided to try it as a, a good opportunity, let's say, to see if brain-computer interfaces could uh, help such patients. And so we tried out uh, a P300 speller, I'll explain just after. Uh, we tried out a commercial one, and it didn't work uh, at the time we tried it. Uh, so we decided to try to do our own system. And um, so the idea I told you about the P300 response already, uh, let's not spend too much time on that because time is, uh, is going fast. But basically, it can be elicited either auditory or visually or even tactile. Uh, the idea is that if somebody is really paying attention to one type of stimuli, and there are several types of stimuli going on, but there's one that they're really interested in and they're counting it. Well, at each time that this stimulus that they're interested in uh, occurs and that they perceive it, then there's a deflection in uh, their activity, which can be measured on uh, the parietal uh, regions of the brain and central and parietal. And uh, it's... It's quite a prominent response. It's, it's, uh, it's quite uh, strong. And this is why it's, it's used uh, and it's measurable by EEG. And it's more and more used in, uh, in brain-computer interfaces. It's re related to some mis other response called mismatch negativity, but I don't have time to go into that. So um, 300, because it comes 300 milliseconds after uh, some event that we're interested in. Uh, but if we want to spell letters using that, and we have to wait for the 26 letters to have occurred, it's going to be really slow uh, to uh, use that as a communication device. So uh, Farwell and Donchamp had this idea to present groups of letters flashing simultaneously. And if the group contains the letter that the person is interested in, then there will be this P300. And when there's a P300, we call it a target response. And where there's, when there's no P300, we call it non-target response because the target is what the person is uh, interested in. So I already showed you this video. Uh, I, don't want, I don't know if you want to see it again. It's uh, a person who is concentrating on here is letter R. She's, she has a word in her head. And she's every time R flashes, she counts like one, two, three. And after a few uh, repetitions of this, uh, this letter, the system is able to, uh, what the system does is it updates the probability of each letter to have been a, uh, a target letter. And it needs a few repetitions because the letters flash in group one. And two, uh, the prediction is not perfect. There's a, uh, some uh, classification errors sometimes, so it has to repeat. So uh, we did this experiment with 20 patients who came three times to the Nice Hospital. And um, 
they were quite satisfied with the system. Some of them wanted to bring it home, but we couldn't like leave it with them because it was an expensive amplifier and uh, and uh, okay, uh, so it's not still not commercial. Uh, uh, solution. It takes a lot, a bit of time. It, take, it took 13 minutes to install the electrodes, put gel on the on each electrode for each uh, session. So it's a bit long. It takes about 20 seconds, sometimes less, depends on the patients, to write a symbol. We did word prediction, so they could uh, uh, write a whole word once uh, once they had started writing. But still, it uh, takes a bit of time. Nevertheless, uh, patients seem to, to appreciate, let's say, uh, that there could be other means of communication uh, coming out. Uh, even though it's, most patients have something that they can rely on still, like an eye tracker, uh, some other um, uh, device to understand their uh, ways of communication, I think the patients appreciate a lot that well, since their brain is totally functional in this disease, it's only the m muscle neurons. Being able to communicate with their brain is a kind of very, it's very satisfying. Um, so uh, we had a, a, a call from, well, an email from a patient who is uh, bedridden in Chambéry Hospital. His name is Damien Perrier. And uh, he has a blog, so he's very uh, happy uh, to communicate about what he does. He asked to try our system. So we told him that we couldn't really, uh, you know, go to Chambéry, and we couldn't really, uh, you know, set it up with him. But if he wanted to download it, he could. So he downloaded the software with the help of a, an engineer, and he ordered on the web a um, three hundred dollar uh, EEG uh, cap. And with his friend, they spent uh, many Friday afternoons trying to get it to work, and in the end, they they did. So they were really. Uh, super happy. And uh, recently, he got a prize from uh, Institut de France uh, for this project, which was Écrire par la pensée. And um, so here, he has a little movie that he, he shot where he shows the system that flashes. And, uh, and uh, it's not very fast. It's not very fast because the electrodes are not in the right place. They're not placed at the, <laughs> at the position on the head where the P300 uh, signal is maximal, because it's just a low quality, uh, well, not low quality, but a, a kind of a basic cap that has only a few electrodes, and uh, they're situated here. And if the signal was in a proper space, proper place, measured in a proper place, it would go much, much faster. Um, you wouldn't need so many repetitions to write. So, OK, I'll finish that. So, so just a, a small, small conclusion. In machine learning, the problems that we have at the moment for, uh, for brain-computer interfaces are the transfer of information from, uh, from one uh, data set to a new data set. Here, uh, in the example I showed you, there were five minutes spent by the subject to write a word that the subsystem already knew, like his name or something like that, just to have labels. And it's a bit uh, annoying to have to spend time on calibration. Um, there's a problem of online adaptation that is, uh, still has to be solved in practice. But uh, one of the maybe bigger problems is really getting users to use these things uh, and getting uh, information about how they, how they manage to, to cope with them, uh, exper acquiring more and more experience and data with uh, users, having living labs, uh, having, uh, designing these things so that people can, uh, can benefit from them. So I would like to just thank all the people in NRIA or INSERM or Nice uh, University Hospital who have participated in this research. Also, we use some software which is made um, open source, um, which is called OpenVibe, which allows to uh, pilot uh, brain-computer interfaces studies. There's support to be acknowledged as well. Uh, and uh, there's also a new society that we have, that we're trying to, uh, to build called Cortico for Collectif de Recherche Translationnelle sur les Interfaces Cerveau Ordinateur. Uh, so you're welcome if you're interested in such a topic to come to meetings of Cortico. So thank you for your attention.
Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, um, it looks like it takes some time for the, the person under this maladie de Charcot to be able to actually figure out what the, those letters are. And I guess there is some sort of uh, group testing that uh, happens in order to actually choose eventually what letter is uh, highlighted. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if you had um, uh, looked at uh, the Dasher system that David Mackey had uh, put in, whereas, in fact, you are more asking for a direction mm -hmm. as to where the, the word is going as opposed to going mm -hmm. through each, and the, uh, yes. e each of the letters, right? Yes. Um, yes, the Dasher system, you just have to control the cursor up and down, and, uh, and the most promising words uh, are appearing, or the most promising letters and, uh, are appearing. Yes, it's, it's a very interesting uh, concept as well. Um, just a you know, keyboard. People have seen the keyboards before, so uh, we could uh, we could make them try out a, a new keyboard. Let's say it wasn't that hard for people to s because they, you may have the impression looking at the movie that they have to be looking at all the groups. No, they, they're just focusing on the letter they want to flash, and at uh, each time this letter flashes, they count it in their head or they they pay attention. So it's not hard. Uh, there was a, a lady who was 93 years old. Uh, who did it? Uh, I don't think she had ever used a mouse, but uh, but she she could do it no problem. Uh, so I don't think there's any um, cognitive uh, capacity less than for the dasher. But the dasher is is interesting because maybe it can be faster. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. Really what I'm getting at. yeah, maybe it can be faster. So it's something to be looked at too. Thanks for this very nice talk. Um, I was wondering uh, what was the upper bound that you could reach with this kind of system. So you mentioned one of the limitations was the variability between participants. But I guess like in the uh, ALS patient, uh, you could train and train that same uh, patient over and over again. So at some point, you are going to be having a lot of data yes. for that patient. Yes. Uh, yes. But what are the other limitations that are going to, uh, to limit the, uh, the um, the accuracy of this, of this kind of system. Actually, um, I can I can give you some experience on the like the best performing users that we had. They weren't patients, but they were people at Inserm Lyon, who just were super uh, proficient, <laughs> and they could uh, type a, a letter after just one, I mean two presentations, because the groups. It's the equivalent of rows and columns, so uh, you can't just have one flash and get a letter. But just after, like for instance, one row, one column, boom, the letter uh, came out. And people, I think, can uh, probably improve their attention, uh, their motivation, and and you could see when we had several uh, sessions with participants that the more they got comfortable and the less flashes they they needed in order for the system to detect their P300. So I have the impression that if uh, such systems become used uh, and that the electrodes are in the right place and that the system is updated uh, correctly, it could it could end up in a fast. Uh, Response. There are people who use it on a daily basis in the U.S. Uh, a little, and uh, they they are able to, uh, you know, use it in a routine manner. So, I really hope we can uh, get systems out that are uh, affordable and that people get to use, and that uh, we can demonstrate that it works. At least for the P300. Then there are limitations. Uh, all, all the different. VCIs, you know, there are BCIs in which you have several classes that you want to be able to classify several uh, classes of motor imagination, etc. And it's hard to know the limitations on the, until there has been enough experience. And that's why in my conclusion, I, in, I insist on acquiring experience and data from, from users. So um, what can be extracted from the different um, electrodes. I mean, can we imagine getting more information when we combine or subtract or whatever mm. mathematical transformation mm. in the spatial correlation that would allow us, for example, to get to be more specific yeah. Yeah. in the detection? What, what are the methods? Are, are you using this spatial um, correlation to really enhance or extract more features that just that would be extracted from a single electrode, well, even if it is well? Located. 
Well, uh, I mentioned at the very beginning the spatial filters, but uh, maybe it's a bit more basic than what you have in mind. Uh, it's just making some weights over several electrodes to get you know, the pattern, uh, the spatial pattern that when you do a linear projection of this pattern on the uh, raw signal, it gives a, well, it's due to the fact that, as you mentioned, uh, different electrodes see the same sources in a way. There's cross crosstalk between the electrodes. So you can use several electrodes at the same time to combine their uh, measurements to um, get some better signal to noise ratio. So this is done all the time. Uh, uh, all the methods that I presented use this. But you can go further and maybe um, be interested more in the coherence between different brain regions. And this could be more specific of certain activity. Because at the moment when I'm talking about a spatial filter, I'm only talking in a way of one um, time signal uh, provided by this spatial filter. But using, looking at different time signals that occur from different brain regions and looking at their correlation in between them and doing some connectivity analysis, I think that has a, a promise for progress in uh, more specificity and getting more tasks if it can be related to something meaningful for the user as a task also. But um, there's no no reason why not. So I think, uh, yeah, we're going to go to more multivariate analysis of brain signals by looking into uh, second order uh, uh, statistics in the, in the signals, time signals. It seems that EEG data is intrinsically uh, some shortcomings, but can, can one improve by increasing the density of electrodes or mm. what, what are the, yeah, um, the avenues for progress there? Well, um, certainly, if you want to do better um, source localization and have more information on where things are coming from inside the brain to be able to be more specific, then it's, it's good to go to maybe 60, 100 electrodes, let's say. That can give you a better, uh, a better uh, uh, sampling of the spatial uh, field that we have. Beyond 100 electrodes, I don't think it's much worth it because uh, the, the topography of the EEG is quite low frequency spatially because of the skull, uh, which um, is not very conductive, as you know. So, um, so um, OK, so there are limitations there. Uh, people go invasive sometimes to, um, okay, uh, it has advantages uh, that for a certain type of uh, activity you can be quite, you can have more degrees of freedom. You've probably seen uh, people actioning a robotic arm uh, using their motor uh, activity. So it's, it can give something very proficient for a certain, um, certain brain area, it can be interesting. Um, the advantage of EEG is that it gives a big coverage. So uh, you can have a lot of things for a lot of different types of information at the same time for, you know. But yeah, as you say, it has limitations. I think that the sensors at the moment are the, you know, the type of um, uh, contact that we have uh, with the current sensors is not, uh, is not ideal uh, because of the need that we have for gel, et cetera, which makes uh, experiments just too cumbersome. So if we can find some good uh, uh, materials that give good contact and better, uh, easier, uh, you know, caps that are easier to put on and uh, that can give better coverage, well, it will make the, the, the main progress. It's a bottleneck. Okay, maybe one last question. No? So I think we can thank uh, Maureen for a wonderful talk.